In this video, we're going to look at continuous valued Markov models, and in particular, uh, autoregressive Gaussian models, which are some kind called or shortened to AR models. Now, this slide should be very familiar to you. It has exactly the same layout as for our n-gram model. Here's the n-gram model slide where we just had to specify um, two things, what the initial state probability was for the um, model and what the transition probability was. And if you compare that to this um, slide here, we're also going to specify an initial state probability and a transition density. Everything else uh, is pretty much the same. So one thing which is different is that the data now are going to assume to be d-dimensional real valued vectors. So whereas y before was a discrete variable that took uh, a value um, from 1 to k, now y is going to be assumed to be um, a vector in general with real valued elements. And the dimension of that vector is going to be d. We're going to assume it's d-dimensional. Great. OK, so obviously categorical distributions are inappropriate for real value data. So what are we going to use in this case? Well, um, we're going to do the most basic thing for this particular model. We're going to assume that the first uh, item in our sequence is going to be a Gaussian uh, random variable. So it's going to be drawn from some Gaussian with a mean mu zero and a variance uh, or covariance uh, sigma naught. And that's going to be now our initial state density. So density, because these are real value quantities. And then our transition uh, model over here, our transition density is going to generate the next item on the sequence. We're Markov, so we only get to look at the previous item in the sequence. And again, we're going to use a Gaussian distribution for this. And uh, the Gaussian is going to have a mean, which is lambda times yt minus 1. So this is going to be a d by d matrix in the general case. So the, the mean of this Gaussian is a, a linear combination of the, uh, of the previous um, element in the sequence. And we're going to have some covariance. And the covariance is not going to depend on the data. So it doesn't depend on the value of yt minus 1. It's always this fixed value, uh, which again is a, a d by d matrix. Um, so a couple of things to note here. Firstly, um, uh, my symbols for, for Gaussians are slightly different from what we used in other parts of the course. So it's now uh, G for Gaussian. This is often commonly used in, in textbooks. So whereas before we denote this as, as N of Y, Mu and Sigma, we're now going to use uh, G and everything that follows in this little section. But it means you know the same formula that we've always been using for, for a multivariate Gaussian here. So I've just recapitulated that to remind us. The second thing um, that's sort of useful to, to know from this model is um, let's think about what the joint distribution over all of the items in the sequence is. So what's the probability of y1 to t here? Um, we know it factorizes in this way, um, but I want to think about the form of that distribution now, what family it comes from. And we also know that if you have Gaussian random variables, and you combine them in a way which consists entirely of linear transformations, possibly with additive noise, you get a Gaussian variable, a set of variables at the end of the day. And this model does exactly the same thing. It starts with some uh, initial Gaussian vector. It then linearly transforms it and adds Gaussian noise through this transformation. And that as a consequence, means that the joint distribution over all of our random variables here um, is also a Gaussian. So we can view, uh, view that in the following way. We can view a vector formed by stacking all of the y's. So this would have y1 as a vector. Let me give myself a bit more space. Uh, y, y1 as a vector. And then on top of it, we'll put, or below it, we'll put y2, and then below that, we'll put y3, all the way up to yt. If we stacked all of those vectors on top of each other to make a big long vector, that joint vector comprising of all the items in our sequence is distributed by a Gaussian with a particular mean and a particular covariance. And that's just a property that, because everything is linear in Gaussian. And this now is a covariance matrix, which is d 
times t elements by d times t elements. So it's a really big covariance matrix if you have a high dimensional time series. And this mean vector has the same dimensionality as, as y1 to t, and so this is a vector which is d times t, rows and one column. Good, okay, um, and so that's one reason why people tend not to um, allow the covariance here to depend on the value of yt. If we were to let the covariance of this uh, transition density depend on the value of yt, we'd end up with a non-Gaussian um, uh, quantity. And uh, it would be no longer true that the joint distribution is uh, a big multivariate Gaussian, and that will lead to um, making much more difficult computations um, when we uh, say fit things to find the parameters or um, we try and remove noise, things are now outside of the Gaussian family and quickly become intractable. So it's kind of canonical to, to have a, uh, a noise here which doesn't depend on the data and a linear transformation of the previous item in the sequence um, to define the mean of the next item in the sequence here for, for that reason. You could develop uh, more nonlinear models though if your time series was nonlinear. Good, okay, so that's the basic first order Markov um, model for real value data. This, as I said, is called um, uh, a autoregressive process of order one. And that's sometimes shortened to AR1 or Gaussian AR1 process. So you'll see this kind of notation in the control and signal processing literature. Um, the order here matches the order of the Markov process, uh, unlike with n-gram models where we have to add one onto the order of the n-gram uh, or to the order of the Markov process to get the n-gram model name. So a bigram model is, is sort of maps to an AR1 Gaussian process. Second order AR2 models are defined in an exactly analogous way. This time the main addition is to our transition density uh, we allow it to not just depend on the previous um, variable in the sequence here, this is just like we had uh, before, but we have also a term from the second, uh, from, the, from the y that was two time steps ago, uh, therefore accounting for these sort of hop arrows in the, in the direct graphical model on the left hand side here. Again, if you use this construction, the joint distribution over all of the variables is a big multivariate Gaussian distribution again. And so you get nice computational properties coming from that. Great, so this is the basic setup. Let's look at a couple of examples here where I've actually set some parameters and I've generated some data using an AR1 and AR2 um, Gaussian process. So uh, I'm gonna make things easy to visualize. So I'm gonna choose, uh, dimensionality for our problem, which is equal to one. So our y's are going to be scalar at each, um, uh, each time in the sequence. Um, and that means that the transition density looks like this. It looks like a, uh, a Gaussian with a mean uh, equal to lambda y1, uh, lambda times yt minus one and a variance sigma squared. So alternatively, I could rewrite this using our properties of Gaussians as our next item in the sequence is equal to lambda times the previous item in the sequence plus sigma times some noise where that noise is just standard Gaussian noise with mean zero, let's be consistent, mean zero and variance one. Okay, these are absolutely equivalent ways of writing this distribution down. This one, you know, may be more intuitive to think about, you know, each next item in the sequence is just weighted by, uh, is produced by taking the previous item in the sequence, weighting it by an amount lambda, which in this case will be equal to 0 0.9, and then adding, in this case, a small amount of noise to it. So because the next item in the sequence is uh, very like the previous one, so lambda here is close to one and the noise is kind of close to zero. That means you'll sort of see nearby items in the sequence to take similar values. So you know, here we've, uh, we've moved down to some low value of y. This is a plot of y as a function of time. Um, so it's a, it's a plot of y one to t, if you like, for a particular realization of this. 
And you can see there's some autocorrelation in the time series. Nearby points in the time series are similar to one another, take similar values. It's quite noisy because of this factor. And this is, is related to Brownian motion, this uh, expression. Things get kind of more interesting when we go to second order processes. These ones are always very rough looking, um, but this uh, AR2 process can look a bit smoother and have some more interesting properties. So again, we're going to look at scalar wise here. And now we're going to move to a second order autoregressive process, Gaussian autoregressive process. And I picked now lambda one and lambda two to have these values. And again, the noise is going to be the same value as it was before. OK, um, and here's what we get out when we sample from this thing. This is a typical sample from this from this process. And if you squint your eyes, maybe you can see that there is some periodicity. You know, the periodicity maybe is kind of obvious here. It's not perfect periodicity, but you can see those peaks followed by troughs with roughly a time constant of maybe uh, you know, equal to something like 10 time steps or something like that. Uh, the reason why this is happening is because of this negative sign in this expression here. So yt uh, tends to take uh, a value which is opposite the value of yt minus two because it has this negative weight um, outside of it. So if yt minus two is very, very negative, yt tends to be positive and, and vice versa. And so this introduces, this negative term here introduces um, periodicity into the samples or negative going parts into the auto correlation function and in general this is just a linear system of course um, with some noise being pumped through it um, and linear systems we know can uh, exhibit uh, three basic types of behavior they can explode in an exponential way they can decay in an exponential way and they can oscillate and this one here, the impulse response function of the linear system, means that it oscillates. And so by appropriately choosing lambdas, you can introduce frequencies of oscillation of different periods and different, different bandwidths. So you should think about these uh, Markov process, these AR Gaussian processes as being able to encode information about the typical spectrum that you'd expect to see in signals. Um, uh, which is sort of handy when you're sort of building these systems to, to model particular uh, data sets. If you know anything about the type, type of frequencies which are present, you can sort of encode that information into the landers. Great. OK, so hopefully this has given you some sort of flavor for what these um, models are capable of capturing, what statistical structure they're capable of capturing, which is useful for when we use them in, a, in an actual modeling a scenario and what we're going to do in the next chunk that follows this is talk a little bit about um, the mathematical properties of these processes doing something sort of very similar to what we did for n-gram models when we start to think about stationary distributions and the like. <laughs>